Hello and welcome to Digital Craft Festival. My name is Helen Vos and I support the creative and professional development of makers, craftspeople and designers. And one of the ways that I do that is as an advisor to Apply Scotland, which is a membership organisation run by makers and for makers. And today I'm delighted to be joined in the show and tell session by seven makers participating in the Digital Craft Festival, who will be talking about the work they make, drawing on the theme of what's your story. Each maker has their own interpretation of this theme relevant to their work, whether that's based on their creative inspiration, the materials and processes they use, where they are based, or how their practice has developed. As they introduce themselves, their work, and share their stories, we will discover more and perhaps find similarities and differences. This is an opportunity for the makers to show and to tell you more about their work that you would have encountered in person on their stands at the craft festivals in Cheltenham, Bobby Tracy and Bath. So we invite you to imagine you've met your friend, you've bought your ticket, you're in the tent or the building and you're ready to peruse and the promise of coffee and cake and a chat about your purchases may be made or coming are just ahead of you. I believe today's session provides us all with a wonderful insight, not only into the maker's work, but in some instances, their creative spaces. You'll find all of the makers on the Digital Craft Festival website. So after today's show and tell, please do go online and explore further and perhaps follow the makers on social media or contact them direct. So to get us started, I invite Alex Swan to introduce us to Little Bits of Printy Things. Hi, I'm Alex from Little Bits of Printy Things. As a lover of story, textiles, print and graphics, my works are engineered from paper and mixed media. I'm inspired by vintage stories, rhymes and sayings, and all my work is made by me. I hand cut, fold, print, bind and assemble everything. I make collections of book works, larger paper characters. You can see Dorothy from The Wizard of Oz just behind me here collages, illustrations, prints and keepsakes. And my work is often described as quirky and amusing due to the quotes that I choose. The words I use are mostly other people's and it's these quotations that inspire my illustrations. Sometimes I draw, sometimes I make things, sometimes I find things depending on what fits the piece for me. I also love a printer's pie of type, which is old printmaking slang for jumbled up lettering. So I hand mix my typeface from found letters, which for me adds a added beauty to my work. With this love for the printer's pie, my poster prints, which are the ones just behind me here, um, I use a mix of letters and, I, and are illustrated with my characters. I also love to play around with the book form. So as well as making traditionally handbound books, this one here is Hansel and Gretel which I print and sew together myself. I also make books that pop out of towers, houses, beds and boxes. This one here is Mary Poppins's carpet bag. And when you open it up, you pull out an illustration from the story along with a quotation. This one is the princess and the pea. And you get to see all the mattresses along again with a quotation. Here we have the White Rabbit's house. This is an illustration from Alice's Adventures in Wonderland when she's getting too big for the house so her arms and legs pop out the side. My work makes great keepsakes and they hold up much sentiment in all the quotes that I use. My tender tokens are a great uh, example of this. They're miniature envelopes which are great for popping into a card in the post or in a bunch of flowers. And I do lots of different quotes, so you get to choose the right one for the right person. I love creating quirky and unusual things, and sometimes it's more the making that I enjoy than the final piece. Thank you so much, Alex. That was just wonderful. And I, seeing, um, seeing the world through your work makes me think that you just must see stories everywhere you go and delight in the idea of how can I take that back to the studio and work with it. Yeah, definitely. And certainly when um, my daughter's now eight, but going back to stories and rereading them with her has been great fun. Um, and we just read all the time and just enjoy stories so much. 
Now, well, that's amazing to be able to gift that onto other people, that ability, particularly through those keepsakes and sent, you know, kind of, um, how do you find people engage with your work emotionally? It seems like it could trigger memories for others. Oh, definitely. Um, that's really what my work's about, because there are so many different versions of the same story and not everybody will have read the same one. So the idea is that as you look through my work or read through my work, that they kind of prompt you to all those memories that you had. Um, and it's for me, I use really old versions. So the, the quotes and things I use are from there, but they all still hold the essence of the story for the person. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Alex. It's wonderful. So um, yeah, head to the website, find out more about Alex's work. OK, we're going to move um, south uh, in, in England and we're going to head to uh, Robin Hardyman, who makes handmade porcelain ceramics. Hi, I'm Robin. So um, making and uh, ceramics is a, is a second career for me. That's really my, my story. I've always been interested in ceramics, especially porcelain. And I've always really loved oriental ceramics. And um, this is a bowl that I picked up in a shop a few years ago, and it was made in China about 900 years ago. And, uh, and for me, that's kind of ceramic perfection, really. And it's this sort of work that's inspired me to do, to do my own ceramics. So about 10 years ago, I decided that I just really needed to understand how these things are made and to explore all that process sort of with my own hands, really. Um, so I signed up for a, for a, a three year course. Uh, which I just found completely absorbing and wonderful and I learned so much and and it's just changed my life really. I set up a studio at home and and I've been making ever since. Um, so I make functional and decorative pieces in porcelain which I throw on the wheel. Um, I love working in porcelain. It has uh, that sort of amazing plasticity when you're when you're working with it and and the finished work has that lovely combination of delicacy and, and strength. And I, I throw thinly, I push the porcelain as far as I can on the wheel to, to end up with walls that are thin and, and translucent. It's all, about, it's all about the forms for me, the shapes. Um, I'm aiming for a kind of pared back uh, simplicity, I suppose, shapes that are kind of balanced and elegant, hopefully. Um, so that could be, you know, a large open bowl with a with a very narrow foot that really lifts it, uh, or a kind of um, a perfectly round and classic moon jar. Uh, the, it's the details and and the finish that I find really enthralling, um, and they're really important to me. So I might add some banding on a on a narrow foot ring or or round a rim in size a line. And on these little moon jars, they're decorated with, uh, with, with slip, liquid porcelain, to add a kind of dynamic element to what's a very quiet shape. Um, and then in my glazes, my palette's kind of cool. It's, it's blues and greens and creams and, and greys, and, and that seems to suit the, the quietness, I suppose, of the, of the pieces that I make. It's, um, some of them are glossy, like this sort of classic celadon. Some of them have a lovely satiny matte texture with a speckle in the, in the surface that adds a kind of depth. And some of them are completely matte and seem to absorb the light completely. And I love, I love the combinations of those. Um, I like making work that you can show in groups, these little cylinder vases, although you know, you can, they're fine on their own, but actually they're like, when you put them together, they're like, pieces having a little conversation and I find that that's good fun. So I'm always exploring new glazes. Uh, that's a life's work in itself really. It's incredibly complicated and, and challenging, but it's, but it's brilliantly fun. It's endlessly varied I find and, um, and I love it. <laughs> um, I, I, what I really liked about what you were talking there is almost like how you're part of the story of of porcelain and ceramics and actually for you kind of delving into the story of the you know the material and the process that you work with and recognizing heritage is you know is really important to what you do is that the case it is actually i mean it's a real joy to feel 
part of a tradition. I, I'm very aware that it's not my tradition, but it's it, it's work that I've always really loved and appreciated. And so to try and understand it better through my own hands has just been a real delight. And yes, there's that sense of continuity and those shapes which are timeless, you know, which which will always be beautiful and they can always be kind of reinterpreted for a contemporary for a contemporary audience, I think. Thank you. Um, I know we have got a few ceramicists with us today. Does anyone have any questions for Robin? You don't have to be a ceramicist to ask the question. Hello, Robin. Is your work glazed or burnished? It's glazed, yes. No, it's all glazed and it's fired in an electric kiln. And do I, I, you... Sorry? <laughs> That's quite a thing, isn't it? Sort of glazing porcelain, because porcelain is can be a little bit unforgiving I can see you've got some beautiful work there <laughs> amazing lots of practice <laughs> I think that's a really good point is that what we're experiencing today with all of you you know with your work in your studios is the you know the amount of time energy effort research you know kind of experimentation learning from others collaboration that's kind of realizing this work it's it is an investment so uh, thank you so much, Robin. Okay, we're going to head back north up the country, uh, across the border into Scotland, into my nearest uh, neighbour today. Uh, we're going to visit Louise McLaren in Perth, Persia, who makes intricate and delicate hand-cut paper works. Hi, I'm Louise McLaren. Uh, I am based in Comrie in Perthshire in Scotland. Um, and I'm, just, I'm in my studio just now, which is the space where I work. Um, and I've also got a small shop where I sell my own work and various other makers and other bits and pieces and it's on the main street in Comrie so I apologise for any traffic noise um, because of that. I've locked the door so hopefully nobody will burst in. <laughs> um, so I am a paper cutter uh, and illustrator so all my work starts off um, as paper cut, cut um, entirely out of one sheet of paper um, and the all my work starts off with the words that are included in them so I think I think all of my work, um, maybe apart from a couple of pieces, has, has all got words or phrases in them. Some of them are direct quotes from people, um, or a little bit, sort of little bit of poems, or parts of speeches and things. Um, and other ones are sort of um, thoughts that I've thoughts or ideas that I've heard from places, and I've sort of taken the idea, the kernel, and sort of turned it into into something, and sort of expanded on that idea and those words. Um, and I have my sketchbook at the back of my sketchbook I've got pages filled with little things that I've jotted down little phrases or like little bits from songs and things and then I've also I've also got Pinterest boards full of quotes um, and also on my Instagram I've got a uh, saved saved stories and uh, and sort of things from various different people um, sometimes to do with images or sometimes to do with um, you know their captions on things and uh, so what I've found actually looking back over the past little while is that each one of each one of my boards there's like sort of themes through them all where obviously there's been sort of things happening maybe in my life or in world events generally and that really dictates what 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 quotes and things I'm gathering that particular time so I found that um, sort of when I very st first started doing this work, all my children were quite small. Um, so all the quotes I gathered around about that time were all to do with home and to do with sort of relationships between people, sort of family and friends and things. Um, whereas sort of the things that popped up sort of four years ago, I think when Donald Trump was first elected, that was all it kind of changed completely and became very much more about um, feminism and to do with sort of strong female quotes and sort of quite empowering things um, and then I think again more recently with Covid uh, and things happening it's changed again slightly and has become about sort of hope and about how we can how we like personally and individually can make a, a change and how in the world and how our own little part of of belonging in the world and our own little actions can make a difference to the whole world I think just sometimes we don't really take that on board and we sort of uh, don't think of ourselves as being important. Um, so I think that's kind of, those events have sort of stirred those things um, in my work. Um, 
And the imagery I use in my work, it's all, so all my work's hand drawn to start with, and then I cut it out with a scalpel. Um, and I really, I love sort of hand drawn illustration um, and sort of folk art, and particularly Eastern European folk art. There's quite a big tradition of paper cutting in that, um, in that kind of, in that area. And I love that sort of slightly wonky hand drawn feel in artwork. I think it's got a real, it's sort of a real authenticity and a, and a feeling you get from it and a kind of emotional connection. Um, and I think that's what I try and do in my work is to, to move people with the words and with the imagery and to sort of stir them and hopefully make them think and, and make them feel things. Um, and that's definitely something that's happened at um, craft fairs before as people have seen my work and have been so kind of moved by the words in them. The, the, there was one poor, one poor lady walked up and she just burst into tears because she'd read something and it connected so strongly with her. Um, and so that's really what I try and do. I really want to make people feel when they read the words, um, read the words in my in my work. Thank you, Louise. Apologies. Um, how are you finding, um, you know, that, I mean, that's a bit like Alex was saying that, you know, it's wonderful that you're able to, you know, kind of through words and imagery and connecting and, um, you know, how are you, that you can evoke those responses in people. And I, I liked what you were saying about, you know, kind of how your works moved into different territories for you. How are you finding the interaction that's maybe more digital now in terms of your, your customers and or viewers, you know, what they're seeing in your work? Uh, yes, I'm definitely missing the the actual meeting of people at craft years and things, because I really enjoy that. I love having a chat with people and hearing what they think about my work and, you know, what it means to them. Uh, and sometimes those sort of conversations can really spark um, another piece of work starting just by something that they comment on or they say. So I'm really missing that. Um, but what I have found is I haven't, I never really used to do Instagram stories, kind of me talking to the camera because I found it so cringeworthy. But I've actually started doing it now. And I think people really, because I found that during lockdown, the Instagram stories I watched where it was makers and things that talked to the camera, there was a real connection. I felt a connection with them. So I've started to do that much more now. And it's amazing how I definitely get more feedback with those kind of stories from people I've met at craft fairs and, and other viewers. So that's, um, that's been really interesting. And I've, yeah, I don't, I wouldn't say I love it yet, but <laughs> getting more used to it. That's really good to know, because actually that was going to be my next question, you know, if you found way so, um, you know, I and I'm sure everyone else, every other maker, you know, kind of who's who's facing these new kind of territories. And um, I think also, you know, kind of exposure as well <laughs> in those spaces. But um, I know that, you know, it's, it's a great way to be able to interact, you know, as, as in kind of real time um, with those who appreciate your work or, you know, maybe want to commission or ask you questions. So wish you every success, success with those. So thanks so much, Louise. Um, okay, now we're going to go south. We're going right the way down to the bottom of the country, to the south coast. We're going to go and visit Becky Crow, um, who makes handmade jewellery to be worn and displayed, which has already got me intrigued. Becky. Uh, nice to be here today. And um, yeah, I grew up in London, but moved to Brighton for university and haven't ever left. Um, and yeah have been here a long time now and have been making for 21 years. So um, usually I'm in a shared workshop uh, with a bunch of other jewellers and ceramicists. There's 13 of us who work together. Uh, currently I'm working in my dining room, uh, which is a bit warmer than the shed, which is where I started during lockdown. So <laughs> yeah, it's... Um, but yeah, I wanted, I, I think I wanted to talk a little bit about just where, where my work has come from. And definitely, um, I didn't particularly set out to be a jeweller. Uh, I made things on my degree that I thought of as three dimensional illustrations, and they had pins on, uh, so technically could be worn, but I was like, oh, I don't think anyone's going to wear them. And um, then I got invited to do this big jewellery exhibition so I got invited to do Dazzle uh, which is a big contemporary jewellery exhibition uh, that happens at the South Bank up in London so at that time it was at the National Theatre and it's still going 
and and that's actually formed a main part of my my business ongoingly over the years um but obviously i've added in other things like uh, the craft shows and trade work um but people have always been quite an important so like my work is very narrative it's very figurative people have always been a very important part of that i actually borrowed a piece off my dad so this is um this is the first piece that i made after i graduated uh so that was a the sort where i started was making kind of big figurative pieces and that did have a pin on but as you can see i just uh, framed it up and i still i think i still uh feel more like an illustrator a lot of the time than a jeweler but i did get a lot better at making jewelry had to learn quite a lot on the way um but yeah the the people people in the pieces and people interacting in landscape have that's probably been a thread all the way through and um started quite big and uh then got much smaller so this is a much more recent piece um in between probably became a bit more stylized i think it was very observational at the start i did a lot of sketching and went out and drew people so yeah like i went out on a windy day with that umbrella guy and saw someone with their umbrella blowing and sat out i'd go and sit at bus stops and draw people just in the park and um that i think i then went through a phase of becoming very stylized and i feel like i've probably moved back a bit towards being a bit more observational so this is another recent piece and again the sense of people and landscape so these ones have maps in the background um and um, yeah, I think I, I definitely draw on things that I enjoy, things that I'm invested in. So there's a sense in which uh, my enjoyment of landscape and being out in it, going walking and climbing or being in the woods or just all of that definitely feeds into the work and places and things that I see in those places also feed in. So in, in broader, in the broader sort of range where I might start off with a very figurative image that is a brooch, I'll make accompanying pieces that pull out elements of that. Um, and whilst I, I, I have made some very autobiographical pieces, I'd say, or that, that have been very personal um, and have quite a bit of investment in them, it's, I think it's always interesting when you, when you make something and invest a bit more into it that, um, it's sometimes harder to let it go. So, you know, like I'll, I'll have displayed, I, I've made sets of pieces before that have mounted and framed and they're a bigger piece. And certainly some have been, have been very personal and then I haven't wanted to let them go very quickly. Um, and maybe I've had them for a few years and that's probably been okay. And by the time they've sold, it's been like, hey, okay, I'm ready to let that go now. Um, uh, but yeah, I think there's something about drawing on the personal and investing in that um, but in the design process hopefully allowing things to become a bit more universal so that when people are looking um, they can see something of their own story in the work that I make um, and so definitely uh, as in a similar way perhaps to Louise I have had people at craft fairs particularly who you can see they're entirely captured by something. And it might be that they go away and then they come back and they keep coming back to the same piece. Um, and you know that it's it has spoken to them and there's something of the story that I've put in it that that, that they'll have a different meaning. They'll, they'll, they'll be investing their own memory or their own association with a piece. Um, but I think the pieces that do that or the, the, the moments like that uh, uh, feel the most significant probably and the most fulfilling as an artist perhaps. Um, yeah. Thank you, Becky. I, I really like the way that you drew the parallels to Louise and I think also a little bit to Alex as well, you know, in terms of how that's kind of created. And I, I just wondered how much do you how much do you allow the, the viewer, the, the person who encounters your work to interpret and how much do you, do you maybe explain it? Do you leave it quite open or is it, do you define it? A bit of a mixture. So I, I do title some of my pieces, which probably, and some of them it feels like the title's important and some of them might have 
some poetry or some words that go with them. But again, I think I think um, the, the the title might be. I mean, like so, this piece that I'm wearing is just. Um, uh, uh, what one is this? It's ascending with the light, I think. Uh, so it's just yeah, hanging lights, you know, in a wood or. It, it's it's generic enough if you like that people could own it in their own way I think there are others that have had much more specific um, words with them but uh, hopefully would still allow for um, yeah people to interpret or own in their own way thank you does anyone have any questions for Becky about her work and her observations and interpretation into her work it would be great if anyone does it's beautiful work. Beautiful. Thank you, Susan. Um, I, I feel like we're, we're about halfway through and I feel like I've got a pair of glasses for each of you. So the next time I kind of go out into, you know, I go up a hill, I'll be looking at that. I'll see, um, you know, kind of women, uh, you know, maybe marching or protesting. I'll be thinking of Louise empowering them. And, uh, you know, next time I'm kind of engrossed in a book or a, a you know, a song, particularly around, you know, kind of fairy tales and stories. I'll be with Alex and Robin. I'll be thinking of you every time I've got a piece of ceramics in my hand. So thank you so much. I think that's a gift in itself. It definitely is. <coughs> so we're going to go west. Not doing too bad at my geography, considering we're going to go west and we're going to head over to see um, Susan Luca, who's a ceramic artist in Devon. Susan. Hello everybody and welcome to my studio. Hello everybody, I hope you're enjoying the craft festival. Um, I'm a ceramic artist and I've been a ceramic artist since 1998. And um, what inspires me is water. So um, I started off doing uh, ceramic pieces, which are Raku smoke fired. And this would be a river, and this would be the River Avon that ran past my uh, workshop. And that was burnished with the pebble as well. And I, I'd done that um, smoke fired raku work since 1998, right up until um, 2018 19, when we had such a horrendous wet winter. And I just couldn't fire my work outside. This is a whole new workshop for me as, as well. And so I thought I would draw upon my drawing skills and my painting skills that influence me for my work and continue walking and drawing and doing lots of my little thumbnail sketches that I like doing. And, um, collecting uh, pictures and photographs and inspiration about my walks and where I walk. Sometimes I would just walk and just photograph because um, I would like to absorb a mood uh, of where I was and I would sit still and just listen to the birds or take in the colours that are surrounding me and come back and draw. And again, because I'm a slab builder, and that's rolling the clay out in flat, and I dry it out on these plaster bats that I've got behind me, building slabs of clay, I've been able to feel that these slabs of clay are like a canvas, a canvas to me that I can paint on. But because I was doing smoke-fired raku, that was a whole different low temperature glazing method. Although I developed all of my own glazes, built my own kilns. To paint on a slab of clay compared to a canvas is very different. So because um, so I developed and investigated and learnt about dry glazes, engobes and clay slips. 
And I had a great time experimenting with all of these and found that when the brush is loaded up with uh, a liquid clay or an engobe or a dry glaze, not to confuse people, because that's the easiest way to describe an engobe, is a dry glaze. It's lots of china clay with a little bit of um, glaze material in it. So when it goes onto the pot, and I fire at stoneware temperatures at 1,200. It's still a glaze, but it's very dry. So you can hear and feel there that that is dry. And then just to add a little bit of sheen, I have actually painted glaze on in there. So this piece, just to walk you through a little bit of my inspiration here, is when we had um, lockdown and it was coming towards the end of lockdown and things were quite stressful really because I had been booked to do five shows this this year I was supposed to be in uh, Nottingham and craft festival and like everybody else you get in your workshop with huge enthusiasm and you start making but as time ticks on realization kicks in as well as to um, your creativity and so I decided to go and sit by the sea so I can uh, late evening when there was no one else around and just take in the mood and this would be the inspiration of this this would be the sea and the sky and uh, sitting on the beach so I've drawn some pebbles there with sgraffito and the other things that I enjoy doing as well is creating uh, lava glazes so it gives you the feeling that I'm on the beach so this has actually got a texture and I, and I think that's actually quite brings me to a point where you have texture in your work and the love for me is to actually have my work out and displayed like at the craft festival and people come along and the first thing people want to do is to pick up your work and touch it and handle it and turn it around and investigate it and look at the base and look at your signature and look inside, because this one's got a nice copper inside because that um, reduction in the kiln. And they, and they, you know, the weight of it, all of these tactile things, people are now denied because um, here we are with other wonderful craft people who are making beautiful work and we are, here in our studios and showing our work uh, for people to see. And I would like to actually um, talk about the pieces that have texture in them. I don't know if you can see that, but when some of the um, dry glazes become quite thick, there is texture there and you know that is what is happening but a lot of these um pots that I have here I name them after I've worked with them because I've drawn here this one um I put some oxides into a wax crayon and then I can draw on the pieces and when they get fired um, it's actually an oxide on the piece and these are all essence of my walks or what I see so it these are people and very often I'll put uh, like the jetty in or if I'm like a seagull I look down on the picture that I've drawn and there are lots of essence of there of my walk um, yeah, this one is um, like the eddy, 
So it was the real movement of the water against the uh, jetties and things like that. So they all had, um, so that one is actually called the eddy. <laughs> Thank you, Susan. I, I, um, as someone who studied in Devon um, for a couple of years, I can definitely, I definitely feel a connection to the work in terms of that colour scape that you have there. You know, the light, um, you know, the shading, particularly kind of through the tones in the, you know, the earth and on the shore and into the sea and the water. Um, and I think kind of as someone who now lives, you know, kind of in Scotland, you, you kind of start to appreciate those kind of quite specific, you know, kind of elements or layerings or even depth of field, I think. So it's beautiful to see them evoked in the work. And what I would like to just reflect is that just even hearing you touch it was just so lovely. <laughs> it was, you know, I, I'm totally with you as I think most people are, is that our, you know, our loss of at this time, which, you know, hopefully is temporary, that loss of the ability to have a tactile connection with things is proving really difficult but thank you for kind of you know just showing those around I, I felt like I got a great sense of your work just by and seeing texture and um finish so the matte and the you know the shiny that you offered so thank you very much thank you. yeah does anyone have any questions for Susan about her work or you know are you are you seeing uh, relating to place just me and my Devon my Devon um, dreams. Yes, there's usually an annual pilgrimage. <laughs> Thank just, you. I was going to say, yeah, just it's I think it it feels like uh, probably lockdown has afforded the opportunity to go and be in places in a way that perhaps ordinarily we're a bit too busy to do. Um, I don't know whether you found that, Susan. Um, yes. Yeah. It it was a very strange time for me when we had lockdown right at the beginning um, and it was we couldn't venture further than five miles from our homes and I walked down the lane that I have here I'm very fortunate I'm surrounded by woodland and it took me right the way back to being a child <laughs> uh, coming from the forest of Dean where there was very little traffic and very few people and just the noise of the birds around me and nature uh, became so strong all of that um, cow parsley on the banks and the beautiful the banks started coloring up and the lime green of the trees and you could hear the wind through the trees and nature became so close and that was a lovely time. I really enjoyed that time. And like you, Becky, drawing on the landscape as you do in your walks and then pulling inspiration from walks and interpreting into your art. That's really been a lovely time. Susan, I definitely am building a picture of your studio and these kind of paths and desire lines kind of radiating out to all these um, you know kind of through the woods through the fields and kind of opening in these enormous horizons it's just yeah. thank you so much for giving us such an insight to your work I think this this medium does have its its benefits you know it does have its positives in terms of um, you know building a picture with our own you know by by bringing our own experiences and our own images with us so thank you very much Susan Okay, we're coming back up north. We're venturing back to the centre of the UK and, and we're heading over to visit Daisy Lee Overton, who's a jeweller over in Sheffield, but with a, um, a definite connection to the Peak District. Yep. Hello. Um, so I am Daisy. I'm the maker behind Daisy Lee Jewels. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. <laughs> um, I work mostly with silver and I do enjoy working with gold, but that tends to be more to commission and um, to create elegant jewellery inspired by nature. And um, so as Helen was saying, I'm based in Sheffield. I'm at Yorkshire Art Space at the moment, which um, if you don't know, it is an organisation that has two buildings in Sheffield 
um, and they are home to over 150 artists. So I feel very lucky to be a part of the community here, um, especially in these strange times. It's nice to be in a shared building. Um, just recently, I finished the starter programme. So that's the two year programme um, for silversmiths. And they also have a ceramicist one as well. Um, the programme offers a fully equipped studio space um, technical support, business support and mentoring. So I was really fortunate to have Rebecca Jocelyn as my mentor um, and she really helped me to develop my work over those two years. So the story for my work kind of starts back when I went to Birmingham. Um, I went to Birmingham to go and, and do my jewellery degree at the School of Jewellery there. Um, it's sort of a bit of a backwards way round of being inspired but having grown up as, you, as Helen was saying in the Peak District um, being surrounded by all this amazing greenery and landscape and foliage you kind of take it for granted so it was only when I moved to Birmingham I was like oh that's really a part of me that's I really miss that I'm such a country girl at heart um, so my space at uni very quickly became covered in all imagery of the landscapes and that greenery um, which fed into my first collection my graduate collection um, rural rings so um, I've got a piece here um, so you can see really sculptural art jewellery forms, really very much statement pieces um, that are intended to be sculptural and to be worn as rings as well. So very much like red carpet statement pieces. Um, you see that there. Um, the processes that I was using at uni involved fold forming, uh, hammering, texturing through um, etching as well. Um, and I really enjoy that sort of working really directly with the metal through hammering it and manipulating it and that's a process that I still work with now but I also have introduced casting to my work and um, so it means that it's evolved and it's much more kind of like creating jewellery motifs which repeat and it's capturing that kind of repetition and the same fluidity of nature but in these sort of um, scaled down pieces so a lot more wearable for every day, but they've still got that same elegance and that fluidity. Um, I really enjoy working with the casting process. I quite like building the pieces. So um, you can see with the bangles here, um, these are like got the cluster effect. So you can build up the little florets. As I say, I work with silver predominantly, um, but I've started to introduce, um, reintroduce the oxidizing that I had with the um, Royal Rings collection. And um, so I use that again with the silver and um, to give a really dramatic kind of effect. And um, I love contrast. So even if it's subtle with a polished finish and a white matte finish silver or um, the really dramatic oxidizing silver. Um, and then more recently, I've been working with the gold plate. So I use um, an 18 karat gold plate on the pieces just to highlight details of the florets. And I love it. It's such a nice colour. It's really warm and it just it goes so nicely with the silver, especially this time of year when sort of taking inspiration from all the not autumnal richness and the oranges and the gold. Um, yeah, so that's the direction that my work has been moving, moving in. Um, so I've been thinking as well about, well, why do I make what I make? And I think that's a question that we've kind of all been revisiting, I guess, during this time. Um, and definitely for me, I have this kind of creative energy. So this kind of comes from when I've been walking in the Peak District and I'm able to get out and outside and it's that kind of mindfulness that you get from being with nature. I also seem to be able to get that at the bench as well. So when I'm making, you know, you're really absorbed in your craft and you're, physical, you're physically able to express that that creativity um, and that's been so important for me in lockdown and I'm sure it has for, for the other makers as well to be able to get that energy out um, and I know it seems to be a bit of a theme at the moment isn't it a lot of people are taking up some sort of creative uh, activity whether it's a hobby or it's a business um, to kind of keep your mental health in check I guess. Thank you so much. Um, I was just, I, I have spotted a sketchbook at the back of your studio. Oh, yeah. Just thinking that Susan and Becky very, uh, you know, kindly kind of gave us an insight. I was wondering what yeah. role does kind of sketching and documenting play? Been a good spot, actually, that. It's not normally something which features too heavily in my work. I tend to 
shy away from the drawing and the sketching. I'm definitely more of a physical. I'd rather just get straight into the material and start making. And for me, it tends to be that each piece kind of inspires the next piece because as you're working, you have these questions and you think, oh, well, I wonder what would happen if, you know, I made that bigger or if, if that was here instead or if, I don't know, sort of those questions kind of get answered in the next piece. Um, but yeah, these are some sketches that I was just fiddling around with during the lockdown. Um, I think I've just found that kind of creative space that we've given ourselves in lockdown has definitely made me kind of um, more absorbed in what I'm doing, I guess. So I've had the time, it's not just been as much as I miss the shows and all the deadlines of everything. It's not kind of having that space to think about what you're doing as well as just right what's next right I need to get this this collection ready for that and I need to get to this show and I need to have this that and that ready you can kind of just take a bit of time to go oh this is my collection I'm really happy with that but what happens now if I repeat this element or if I try this process instead so it's been a really good exploratory time I think and from what you were saying sounds um you know kind of really relevant to to your practice at this time and you know kind of consolidating and you know building your you know kind of collection and your profile mm. as, a, as a jeweler and it sounds like you're in an amazingly supportive space that sounds great yeah. does anyone have any questions for Daisy no problem no problem. It's always me. I'm always the one with a question. I've always had a question uh, because I am quite nosy. And, and I must admit that, you know, um, one of the great things that's been, you know, wonderful about, you know, kind of these online um, opportunities to, you know, kind of meet with makers, to talk with makers. And I think I referenced it as, at the beginning is you get an insight into a creative space. I'm quite a hungry person for creative spaces. I like a studio, you know, I'll notice a tool or something. So, I suppose to just now is quite a good opportunity to say thank you for letting us into your, you know, kind of possibly quite private creative spaces, all of you. Okay, thanks so much, Daisy. Right, so our um, uh, final maker today um, is Vivian Ross, who uh, uh, works with slip decorated earthenware ceramics. She's slightly west of uh, Daisy in Staffordshire. Uh, Vivian. Hello, uh, my name is Vivian Ross. I'm, uh, I make functional earthenware decorated, as you've said, with slips and, and fig figurative decoration that I'm known for. And yes, I'm just the other side of the Peak District uh, on the bottom sort of. Uh, and in fact, I started in Sheffield, so I know Sheffield very well, but I moved across the Peak District for personal reasons. Um, and I've been a potter for nearly 25 years. I haven't quite done the exact maths, but quite a long time. Um, Clay is definitely my passion. Um, it's become my la language of communication and making sense of the world in, in the way I work. It's, it kind of gives you a, that time to just make sense of things. And that's just really important. And that's part of what makes up the narrative of, of the pieces, if you like, although they're, they're not particularly planned. Anyway, I thought I'd, um, I'd just to let you know, I'm in my studio. I've sort of got a makeshift bit of a display. It's a little bit, I've got a Pretty stink sink, well used behind me, bit bit of a bit of a mess, but yeah, there's little bits of uh, past work, um, figures that I went off and tried at one point, and I might go back to and revisit at some point. I would like to, um, but I am mostly known for um, the pieces on the shelf, so functional um, ceramics. Um, so I thought I'd tell you about how how I make them and see where we go from that. Um, the shapes are essentially press molded, very simple, with coiled additions. Um, and more recently, I've started throwing again as well, and but not just throwing nice pieces, throwing, chopping them up, nothing so simple. Um, <laughs> but yeah, and I, I use, a, I should say, I use a red, a red earthenware clay um, to start with, which is the first thing once I've made the sh shapes, I'll have a, sh I'll work in a batch of a number of pieces, take uh, half a dozen of various different sizes um, and then I'll coat them with a, a white slip and this obviously gives a, a nice base but it also just gives a warmth and you'll get flecks of the brown of the red clay coming through which I really love um, and that slightly means it's just a little bit unpredictable in places love that um, 
the next stage i've got a piece here that's halfway made this is um yet to be drawn on but the next stage is um where i apply stencils and i have hundreds of these also cut out out of um layout paper so it's nice and thin so i can wet it and then compose the picture on the piece depending on the piece i love that state it's my favorite part of it i'll have a palette of people and i'll just compose and um compose um you know place things and that's kind of what makes them so so this is one that's sort of at that stage i don't know if you can see it's sort of very pale because of the color that's actually going to be a blue um various people and at that point i'll uh, coat it in, an, in, in the color so you're left with that and these get peeled off which i can't do for you but i'd like to <laughs> good yeah you peel those off and that's when i draw freehand um with the scalpel blade to sort of bring them to life a bit more and to define areas um and my tools my toolkit my essential toolkit very simple it's only a few things to make the marks mark making love all that um some of the the, the themes in them um i try and sort of work intuitively keep, keep it spontaneous and playful so there's an element of um they're not always planned out clearly um and it's often my rambling thoughts and it's quite chaotic <laughs> my thought process so it, this is what i mean about bringing you know order and sense to things um i don't tend to they're not stories in themselves but i tend to work to themes um so family is a big one love friendship but also deal with anxiety so outsider maybe um isolation i work on my own a lot so you know i'm thinking about all these things and i've got um i've got three children so there's lots of things that feature threes joined together i love the joined up figure that's sort of i don't know if you can see that the, the light shining um if you hold it a bit closer oh yes 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 see um anyway um so yeah lots of lots of threes I, i'm from three sisters i've got three children so somehow they just seem to emerge in there i don't again don't always plan it um and the other sort of symbols so other things i'm interested in come into it's not all about me <laughs> i hate to say and and i love that there's ambiguity in them and that people can bring their own sense and that's kind of something that the shows enable you you know that that interaction i don't find it so easy online i am trying to catch up but the shows is really nice when people come up and tell you what they're about what the piece is about and I'm, i love that and and quite often I'll make someone smile and they'll tell me that just makes me smile, you know, they, their face radiates a smile and that's a really nice feeling. And occasionally I might not be quite next to my stand and someone will come up and with their friend, just having had their coffee, you know, <laughs> and, and they're laughing and, and they've, they've, they've identified with it. And, and that's what I love. That's why I do it. And so. Um, that's awesome. Awesome. I just wondered um, whether people ever ask you to, uh, to put specific um, people on a piece? Like, do you get commissioned to do? Yes, I do like get com commissions. I was sort of going to end on commissions, but yeah, that's it. Um, I definitely do, I get commissions. I've got, um, yeah, for, for celebratory pieces. So, so and, and the nice thing about pottery is it's gonna, it's gonna last long after I'm here. And it's something, you know, they are pieces to treasure. They're quite intimate, some of them in, in terms of, you know, when you pick them up and be close to them there, there's an intimacy to them that's really nice but yeah they're celebratory of you know coming together houses whatever but milestones in life i suppose um and i was very interested in in your um naming of pieces because i've actually started to name some of my never done it it's always been green pot blue dish you know because naming them I, I i wondered whether it would lead people into thinking they're about something more specific that, and I, I kind of really like them being open and, and for people to have their own interpretation and it becomes a two-way thing and it's the same with commissions really it's really nice working with uh, people and getting you know some people send me photos send me all sorts of photos but um, um and I've got 
one I'm working on a commission at the moment and he's, he's asked for I don't often do words but he's asked for a quote and it's from a song I listen to low I always have music on when I'm so you know and there's that already I'm connecting with this person and he, he just fully gets it and I love that he's just left me to it I mean that's kind of quite brave isn't it as a customer but he yeah he gets it and that's really nice um I wanted to ask a question um Viv about do you find that um, do you have like repeat customers and are they kind of almost building their own, you know, building a collection, but telling their own story through your work, you know, almost like you were saying it can be a bit chaotic for you to create them, but uh, do people select to build their own kind of narratives that, you know, in a domestic? Yeah, I, I, I don't know about their own narratives, but definitely have repeat customers, thankfully. <laughs> um, people who, yeah, and I suppose they do, they kind of make nice gifts. There is some, there's a sentiment in there sometimes that you kind of want to share. You know, they are about, they're celebratory of the, of the really simple things in life. I mean, I can't emphasize it enough. Those are the things I love. It is walking in the Peak District. It is a bottle of wine with friends. It is spending time in allotment our pets, you know, we love them. So th th these often get featured and, and uh, you know, and, and, and they do make nice gifts, kind of a little poetry in a bowl sometimes without any words. <laughs> poetry in a bowl. Well, I don't know, well, I'm, I'm, no, maybe not. <laughs> Does anyone have any questions for Viv? About her poetry in a bowl. <laughs> But I've identified with every maker today and it's been lovely mm. elements from everybody and it's been fascinating. Um, so. No, I'd agree. Alex, you were going to ask a question. I was going to ask whether there was a sort of favourite subject that you like to decorate your uh, uh, work with. Um, a favourite subject? I don't know. There's themes that kind of crop up again and again and it's often... Um, it enables me to think about and, and make sense or, or maybe sort out issues or problems that I have as well. But yeah, family family comes up a lot um, in a good way. And and the joined figure gets has become quite a, a strong image and, and especially of late, you know, Brexit and things like that. Um, just feeling like we are, we are all in this together and, and that so became really kind of important to me. Um, and I love, I just love the image. So I've been playing around with that for, for quite a while now, a good year or two. It's become a strong point. It started, I, I have, I think I mentioned it, I did a show and tell before and I mentioned this. This is a, uh, a wedding spoon I made for my sister. It's just quite crudely made, but it was made before I, no, I think I just got a workshop and it was the joined figure and I'd seen it on something and uh, that's where it originated. Um, it's two little people just to celebrate the coming together of my sister and her husband um and every everybody that came to the wedding got one as a as a sort of memorable gift um so things like that and that was lovely and i've sort of revisited that image again and again and again so yeah thank you viv what wonderful and uh, kind of a lovely note to finish on is that idea of you know kind of very personalized gift you know kind of from someone who's you know kind of gifting to their you know, the people they want to have around them and close to them and celebrate with. I think that, you know, that spoon kind of almost embodies quite a lot at this time, you know, of, of togetherness and tactility yeah. and, you know, so thank you very much. Now, um, sadly, our time is up for our show and tell session. And I think that we've, we've finished really well. And I think, like you said, you know, associated with a lot of things that everybody said, and um, there were definitely some themes that run through there. Um, around the importance of place and the kind of the wandering, the absorbing, the taking the time, you know, the translation of the story into the work, um, our hunger for tactility. I'm sure we'll get back there again and much, much more. So I'd like to thank you all for kind of giving your time today. Um, the brilliant thing is, is that the Digital Craft Festival continues online from Friday the 27th to Sunday the 29th of um, November. Um, thanks to Sarah James and the whole team for making the virtual opportunity, you know, for us to have this level of engagement and celebration and discovery and learning. And I would like to hope, importantly, purchasing these works could be in your hands, they could be in your homes, they could be in your workplaces, they could be a gift to a loved one. Um, so head on over to the Digital Craft Festival website, the address will come up at the end of the film. 
you'll be able to explore more about the makers um, on that space, in that uh, online space. You know, as I said, maybe give them a follow, contact them um, and find out more. Um, but just thank you so much to all of you, our amazing makers for contributing. We had Alex Swan, Robin Hardiman, Louise McLaren, Becky Crow, Susan Luca, Daisy Lee Overton and Vivian Ross. And thank you for kind of coming along and watching and listening. And we really hope, uh, you know, I echo Susan's sentiment that you just have a brilliant rest of your digital craft festival experience. Thank you and goodbye.